So welcome to Pai Bay, and it's a beautiful day out there. So uh, thanks for coming, everyone, and uh, hopefully the blue angels don't get too in our faces today. Am I echoing? Okay. Okay. I will just keep. I'm going to keep banging on. So uh, I'd like to quickly thank the Pai Bay organizers and the staff. And I hope I speak on everyone's behalf when I say that we appreciate all of the effort that they put into organizing this. So, tiny bit about me. So I have been a software engineer and a manager and an engineering leader for over 25 years now. And I've had the very good fortune of working at some really great companies, including Google and Twitter and Foursquare. And most recently, I was the last seven years the co-founder of Toolchain, which uh, was a startup in the build system space that uh, sadly no longer exists. So I'm on sabbatical at the moment. However, I do have a lot of experience working with and on build systems, and particularly uh, for growing uh, repos that have to scale. And so that's what we're going to be talking about today. Uh, let me just check that. Yeah, you can see what I hope you, you're seeing. So we're all here because we're enthusiastic about Python, I assume. But we can learn how to use Python more effectively by, in our projects by learning by comparison to other languages and what they have to offer. And so to start, we're actually going to go on a little non-Python diversion. And we're going to talk about another language. Specifically, we're going to talk about Rust. So. How much familiarity is there with Rust in the room? Has anyone worked in Rust? Anyone done much with it? OK. So for some of you, this will be familiar. For others, not so much. Um, obviously, we're only going to give a very quick taste here. But if you're not familiar with Rust, it's a relatively new language that came out of Mozilla in the late 2000s and underwent several iterations of change, early changes before it kind of settled into a stable release in 2015. So this is a very recent language uh, with a lot of uh, momentum behind it. So what's worth knowing about Rust? So Rust is a compiled language. Uh, it compiles down to native code. And it's designed for high performance and for concurrency. And the most notable feature, I'd say, of Rust is that it enforces memory safety at compile time. And so there's no runtime garbage collection. There's no, no equivalent to a global interpreter lock or anything like that. Um, the language itself, the structure of the language, guarantees uh, memory safety. And so as you can imagine from that description, Rust is first and foremost a systems language. And it targets the same use cases as C and C++, but its design eliminates several categories of like memory common memory safety bugs that often lead to security vulnerabilities. And that's really why Rust exists. And because of this, as of late last year, Rust is the first language other than C and, and assembly language to be allowed in the Linux kernel, which is a huge deal. Now, granted, very much a work in progress, and nothing in the Linux kernel is currently, except the tooling to use Rust, currently exists. But that is a huge, huge step. So if you think about Rust and Python, obviously, they occupy very, very different quadrants of the language design space. They're optimized for very different things. And you won't be surprised to learn that Rust code is typically a lot more complex than the Python equivalent, because all those features I talked about don't come for free. But this does make these two languages complementary. If you had to introduce a second language and you were using one, then the other makes a lot of sense. And in fact, they even interoperate well, as I'll briefly touch on later in the talk. So personally, I'm a big fan of Rust, as well as a big fan of Python. And I do recommend looking into it as a complement to Python when for cases when you need the performance of native code, uh, even at the expense of extra complexity. So if you've done any work in Rust, or maybe even if you haven't, you've definitely heard of or interacted with um, a binary called Cargo. Every Rust book, every Rust tutorial just has you using this thing called Cargo. What is Cargo? So at its most basic, Cargo is a high-level binary that takes a simple imperative verb, like build, or test, or run, or format, or something you want to do, and it translates that into the more complicated underlying tool invocations that fulfill that imperative. And I think the best way to see that is by example. So now I'm going to take my life in my hands and attempt to make a little AV change here to mirror my display. And now, can you see my command line here? 
Oh, you can, fantastic. Okay, so we're gonna look at some Rust Hello World, but when it, the syntax doesn't really matter because what we're gonna look at is the tooling. Uh, so just to kind of see what we've got going on here, there's these like cargo toml and cargo lock, which we can ignore for now. And then we've got this main.rs, which is the Rust uh, source file that implements our hello world. Uh, and if we look at what that looks like, it's exactly what you'd expect from a hello world. I did break out the actual generation of the hello world string into a separate function, just to be a slightly bit more fancy, but this is just hello world. And so, okay, so the first thing we probably want to do, remember that this is a compiled language, is that we might want to compile it as we're iterating and adding features. We want to make sure we haven't broken things. We want to compile it. Oh, for God's sake. Um, okay, so lesson is do not touch anything. <laughs> and be very delicate. Okay, so we want to compile. So um, Cargo makes this very easy. We just do Cargo, whoops. Build. Now the dash V you don't need, that is for verbose output, which I want in this case, just so we can see a little bit more of what's going on. So I ran cargo dash V build and it built my hello world and it's buried the binary somewhere in the target directory. So because I ran with dash V, you can see that under the covers, cargo ran this extremely long and complex command line that involves invoking Rust C, which is the Rust compiler with a lot of options, some of which come from defaults and some of which come from configuration, but Cargo took our simple imperative build and broke it down into actually here's a fairly complicated thing that needs to happen uh, in order to do this build. So, great, now what else can we do with Cargo? Uh, we can, for example, run the binary. We could go digging into that output directory and run the binary manually, but it's more fun if we do a Cargo run. There's, you know, it ran the binary and it uh, emitted hello world. And of course, as you can imagine, the nice thing about using cargo run as we're developing is that if I had made changes, cargo would know that it needs to recompile before it runs. Whereas if I'm running things manually, I have to build separately and then I have to remember to build separately and then uh, run. So that's an example, a couple of s trivial examples of what we can do, what cargo can do for us. Let's look at a slightly more fancy example. So another thing that we obviously want to do as we're developing is run tests. So uh, switch branches and let's see what uh, this has added. So in this branch, we've added a test. Now Rust is fun in that you can actually put test functions in simple cases at least inside the source file that you're testing, which is pretty neat. So here's a very simple unit test, and we are going to run it by doing cargo dash v test. And look at that. It recompiled because the source has changed. We've added this test. And it ran the test, and it gave us the output of the uh, test. And again, if we now go and edit the file, uh, even edit some other file that this file depends on, cargo will do the right thing, compile the codes that needs to be compiled, compiled and run the test. Uh, what else can we do? So let's uh, change branches again. This branch now adds some, and I'm hoping you can all still see my command line, right? Great, just give me a yell if, if not. So what have we got here? In this branch, I've introduced a couple of um, style and uh, lint and style errors. So we've added an import that isn't being used, which is a lint error. So use is how Rust spells import. And we've added some superfluous new lines in there and we've kind of broken the style guide. And so now cargo fix did something. And uh, if we look at what it did, it got rid of that useless uh, uh, import because the compiler knew that it wasn't being used and cargo was able to use that information to uh, fix the file. And we can do cargo format to get rid of those superfluous uh, new lines and make the file conform. Uh, obviously these are all very simple examples, that's what Hello World is for, but this is all uh, designed to give you a flavor of what cargo is for. Uh, so this has now edited the file, so I'm going to uh, oops. 
get things back to normal. And now we're going to go back to the slides, if I can make that work. How does that look? Fantastic. OK. So Cargo is this sort of Swiss army knife thing, right? It runs a bunch of underlying tools, like the Rust-C and the formatter and the compiler and the tests and does all this stuff. And the nice thing about this is that if you know how to build any cargo project, and literally every Rust tutorial will show you how to do that, then you know how to build every cargo project. Like every Rust project out there uses this tool, and it uses it in the exact same way. And so there's this very simplified, uniform interface on top of a lot of gory details and config and God knows what. OK, so that's neat. I know it's not earth shattering yet. It's neat. You could sort of get this with some shell scripting or maybe with some make files. Like you, you, there are ways to get this without cargo. But that gets harder and harder to do as your project becomes less and less of a toy. So what happens when your project starts to scale? So two things happen. The most obvious one is that everything just takes longer. Right? The more source files you have, the longer they take to compile. The more tests you have, the longer they take to run. And you are all, of course, writing tests um, as you uh, write more code. And so at first, you, know, you run tests, and um, it takes 30 seconds, and you don't really care about performance. And then it starts ticking up. And then a year later, it's like five minutes. And then a year after that, it's like 25 minutes. It starts to get pretty annoying and laborious and uh, disruptive to your workflow. So now you're thinking, hmm, OK, shell script's not really going to cut it. We need more sophisticated tooling here that can speed things up in various ways, like selectively running just the tests that are relevant to your changes, uh, or using dependency tracking, or using uh, caching and concurrency. There are all sorts of ways to speed things up. So one thing that happens as your project scales is everything gets slower, and you need more sophisticated tooling to dig you out of that performance hole. The other thing that happens as projects scale is that you start depending on an increasing amount of third-party code. So you know, this is extremely common in basically every language ecosystem, obviously, in Python, but also in Rust. Uh, you have all these third-party packages that provide really useful critical functionality. And they need to be resolved. That is, all their versions need to be pinned. Uh, they need to be downloaded and, in the Rust case, compiled or installed. Um, and all of this needs to be sequenced correctly, right? So if I want to run a test that depends on some third-party dependency, then that third-party dependency needs to be installed before the test can run. But I don't want to do that process every time because it's very time-consuming. There's downloads, there's um, compiling, there's installing, there's like a lot of stuff. So now we need a tool that needs to know how to manage uh, third-party packages in an efficient way uh, and only rerun that kind of work when it needs to be rerun. So again, we're getting further and further away from, eh, I can just shell script this. Um, you could you know, theoretically do a bunch of this in make, uh, but it's hard to do correctly in make, and it requires a huge amount of work. Like th The make files get very large and very hard to maintain very quickly. Uh, and make doesn't always scale well, and certainly shell scripts do not. So instead, Cargo handles these challenges for us. So if we think first about speed, about performance. So Cargo tracks dependencies at a very fine-grained level. And it uses, uh, much like Make, it uses file modification timestamps to only rebuild code um, as it's needed. But instead of relying on you manually writing a Make file to express all these dependencies, it knows about them because it gets that information from the compiler. And so um, knowing about being able to track dependencies at a very fine-grained level lets you only do the work that absolutely has to be done in uh, a given situation. Another way that uh, Cargo speeds things up is uh, concurrency. So for example, it will run multiple compile jobs on multiple cores in parallel when it can. And it will run tests in multiple threads even in the same test process. So um, two really big levers here to get better performance. One thing. Cargo, unfortunately, does not do is it does not use a cache. So what that means in practice is if you build in some state, edit some files, build again, and then revert back to that previous state, you will have to rebuild it again because uh, Rust has, uh, Cargo has no memory of uh, that previous build that you did. It only understands the current state and changes to it uh, going forward. Um, so you know, that's an idea. Um, you, you can probably see where I'm going with this. But um, that's kind of how Cargo really helps with uh, build performance. 
And then the second point regarding handling third-party dependencies. So as you saw in a bullet point on an earlier slide, Cargo is not just a build system, but also a dependency <laughs> manager. So think of it like pip um, for Python or Maven for the JVM. Um, it works kind of similar to those tools in that you specify loose version constraints in of the third-party packages you directly depend on in this cargo.toml file that I asked you to ignore earlier. And then cargo automatically generates a lock file, that's the cargo.lock that I asked you to ignore earlier, and that pins uh, the exact versions of not just the loose packages you asked to depend on, but all of their transitive dependencies. And so this is called resolving your dependencies, and it runs various sophisticated algorithms to find a self-consistent set of transitive dependencies, and it bakes them into this lock file, and it adds um, checksums, it adds like cryptographic hashes of every file that you might depend on, and then at build time, it uses that lock file to download and compile the relevant third-party packages. And this is what gives you, for example, reproducible builds. Like you have a lock file, and if you check out your repo at some time in the future, then the dependencies will come from that lock file and not from whatever is the most current thing on the internet. So we can demonstrate that. Um, let's switch us back to mirroring. How does that look? Perfect. So now I've added a third party dependency. So let's see what that change looks like. So in cargo.toml, under the dependencies heading, I added uh, a dependency called uh, ANSI term, and I'm on the dependency is on 0 0.12, um, which basically is shorthand for saying I will accept any point dependency in the 0 0.12 family. So 0 0.12.0, 0 0.12.1, 0 0.12.2, whatever you find, I'm willing to use that. And all ANSI term is is a lightweight library that gives you utilities for emitting uh, color escape sequences to an ANSI terminal. And you can see here that I'm using it in the hello world. And so now if I cargo run, a bunch of things happen. First of all, at the end, you can see that the colors got used, and that's kind of nice. But you can see that cargo, just because I changed some configuration, went and did a bunch of work. It went to the craze.io index, which is um, the Rust equivalent of PyPI, it's the sort of standard package repository. It looked for some version of ANSI term that is compatible with my requirement, which was 0 0.12, and it found 0 0.12.1, and it baked that into the lock file, which we're about to see. And then it downloaded it, downloaded all of its dependencies, compiled everything, then compiled my code against it, did all of that. Now, as you would imagine, if I run this a second time, most of that laborious stuff didn't happen a second time because Cargo is smart enough to know that it doesn't need to rerun it. And so, if you look at what happened, like I had a clean state and now I have changes to cargo.lock. And if I look at what they are, basically um, a file that pre was previously empty, I didn't show you that, um, now has all of these locked packages for uh, ANSI term and all of its dependencies. Let's, uh, right, so you can see there at the top, there's the uh, lock and the checksum for ANSI term, and then there's a bunch of things that ANSI term itself depends on, specifically for Windows. Uh, don't really need to go into that. So that's how, uh, that was a quick demo of how Cargo acts as a dependency manager. Am I back to my slides? Splendid. So Cargo has three big benefits. A simple, uniform user experience across the entire language, across all repos. Uh, it manages uh, a lot of performance concerns for you, and it manages third-party dependencies for you. And I think many people will know that that is actually very substa is sub sub substantial and crux part of code base management. So, the Rust ecosystem is really entirely managed via Cargo. It is the one true standard tool for doing basically everything. You can add uh, functionality to it. There's a plugin mechanism. This is how Rust works. So Rust is a very tight ecosystem with this one standard tool chain. And I'm using the word tight uh, to mean you know, a very prescribed way of doing things that ships with the language, essentially. Uh, and I thought it'd be interesting to quickly look at some other languages and see how 
quote unquote tight their ecosystems are. So this graph is the x-axis is the year that the language was first released, and the y-axis is my extremely subjective uh, assessment from one to 10 of how tight the ecosystem of that language is. And so we've talked about Rust. If we go back a few years to Go, then Go is fairly tight as well. It ships with tools for sort of building, testing, and linting, and fixing, and dealing with dependencies, and so on. And they all run under the uh, Go binary. It is a little less tight than Rust in the sense that um, how Go deals with third-party dependencies has historically been in a lot of flux. And um, very often, you end up needing extra tooling to kind of handle that. Um, but nonetheless, I would classify Go as a, a pretty self-contained, tight uh, ecosystem. Uh, if we look at Node, then in typical JavaScript fashion, it is tight, but there are, <laughs> there are multiple e underlying ecosystems, and each of them is relatively self-contained, so NPM and Yarn being two obvious examples, and I don't know, by next week there might be another one, but um, generally speaking, if you pick one, it is relatively uh, self-contained and relatively standardized. If you know how to use Yarn in your repo, you know how to use it in every other repo that uses Yarn, which I recognize is a hell of a caveat. If you go back even further to JVM, that is even more loose, right? There's no single standard for anything. Maybe SVT is a bit of a standard for uh, Scala. But in JVM world, you've got to pick from like Ant or Maven or Gradle or SVT or um, uh, Bazel or Buck, uh, which are these more sophisticated systems or Pants, which is in the same vein and which we're about to get into. And if you go all the way back to you know the 80s, then C++ really is a complete free for all. I mean, C++, is just essentially a book. And <laughs> typically, right, you have to use make files or something more sophisticated than make files to cobble together the workflows that you want. It's extremely laborious. You can use something like Bazel, which is the open source variant of Google's internal uh, system Blaze. It's very sophisticated. It really is designed for C++ at scale, but setting it up and configuring it, it is a you know, multi-year project in some cases. The main thing I want to take away from this is that generally the newer languages, the more recently it was released, the uh, more tight and self-contained its um, ecosystem and its tool chain is. And I think this reflects this growing realization over the last decade or so that the ecosystem is a really important part of the language. And that language design can't stop with like, here's how you do loops and here's how you do branching and here's how you build hello world, but it really has to address how you build growing complex systems. And that brings us to Python. So Python is a venerable language, right? First released in 1991, so it predates even Java. And so for historical reasons, the Python ecosystem is quite chaotic. So Python itself ships with basically just an interpreter. There is almost no tooling. And to start putting like scalable workflows together, you have to like figure out this massive, bewildering array of single purpose tools many of which are not standardized, so there's many competing tools doing variants of the same thing. You know, there's pip and twine and pytest and setup tools and mypy and pywrite and black and pylint and flakeate and rough and I could just go on. There are dozens of these tools. Uh, many of them overlap, right? There are so many different linters and there are three different type checkers for some reason and there's just so much of this uh, going on. And the expected mode of use of these things is that you install and run each one individually. And that means uh, learning, how do I install each tool? How do I invoke it? What are its command line options? How do I configure it? How do I make sure that everyone in my organization is using it this, at the same version in the same way? Uh, you know, that is a non-trivial thing. And worse than that, what happens when you need to sequence these tools? So to go back to the uh, example I showed with Cargo, say you want to run some tests using PyTest. First, you need to resolve and download and install uh, the third-party dependencies for the, uh, that code. And again, that's very heavyweight work, so it's not something you want to do every time. You only want to do it when you have to do it. So now you need tooling that can do it when it needs to be done, but not do it when it doesn't need to be done. Uh, and conventionally, Python has not had a very robust answer for how to do this. And so this, uh, finally, halfway through the talk, is where Pants uh, comes in. So what is Pants? Uh, Pants is a build system that works with multiple languages, uh, but does have particularly strong support for Python. And that really is the core of its uh, usage today. So in the context of this talk, you can think of it as cargo for Python. So it's inspired by Bazel that I mentioned and Buck, uh, which is a similar thing out of Facebook, um, and a few other systems in that space. 
But where it differs from those systems is that they were designed for typically C++ or JVM. And if they have Python support at all, it's kind of a byproduct or, and it's not very good. Um, whereas Python support deeply permeated the design of Pants. Like we, it was built for this, or at least the current version was. Uh, I say that because Pants is an open source project, but it has a convoluted history. Uh, it started out as an internal project at Twitter, and that was mostly for speeding up Scala builds. And so you can think of that as like Pants v0. And my personal involvement was that I was one of its early uh, contributors at Twitter, and in 2012, I was instrumental in open sourcing it. And so that open source version was, you can think of that as Pants v1. Again, mostly for Scala, it had some support for other languages, a little bit of Python support. Um, but it was a niche system because Scala was a niche language. So it was used at Twitter and at Foursquare and at uh, Square and a few other companies of that vintage. Um, but it never really took off. Um, but what happened in 2020, so much more recently, is that the Pants open source community launched Pants v2, which is the current version. And that is a complete ground up rewrite. It, with, it literally only shares a name um, with that earlier version. And that had much, much stronger emphasis on Python support. And this is because you know, Scala was not picking up much steam in the industry, but Python really was, uh, for multiple reasons, including the fact that it's the language of choice for, for data science applications, uh, which was getting big in the last decade. And so we went from, you know, Python was the little scripting language around the edges of your real code to people building massive systems and code bases in predominantly Python. And so Pants v2 has taken off since 2020, since we launched it, uh, has taken off um, much more impressively. And that demonstrates that there was and remains a real need for this kind of tool, a sort of cargo for Python, if you will. Um, and regarding the name, I would love to say that Pants is some play on words of like cargo pants or something like that. But alas, uh, it predates uh, cargo by several years. And uh, the name is an acronym that is like lost in the mists of time and doesn't matter. Um, so anyway, let's look at Pants a bit. What is it good for? So as you'd expect, Pants is useful when you want to scale up your Python repo. Um, and the observation here is that Python tooling is mostly designed to deal with a single thing, right? a repo, a small repo that builds a single binary or a single distribution. And this is evidenced by the strong convention of having a root level uh, setup pi or pyproject.toml and the root level requirements.txt. Uh, and the tooling is sort of built around that view. And the tooling ecosystem has very little to say about a code base that deploys dozens of like related things, like binaries and distributions and uh, Docker images and cloud functions. Uh, but that is a very real world concern. And so of course people find, you know, life finds a way, so people find ways to hack around this. Uh, but the tooling is not really, most of the Python tools are not really fundamentally designed um, to work uh, on some small subsection of a larger repo. And so absent a tool like Pants, it's very hard to scale a code base. And the solution is often to split the code base up into multiple small repos. Uh, and I have a whole separate talk about why that can be bad, um, which I'm happy to talk about after this. But uh, let's just take as given right now that you may not want to do that for various uh, organizational uh, reasons and reasons that have to do with the difficulty of dependency management and code sharing. Um, but instead, um, we're seeing increasingly organizations are adopting this so-called monorepo approach where you have a single unified code base and you build multiple uh, related things uh, from it. When I say single, maybe you have two, maybe you have three because they really are completely different projects. But generally speaking, you don't split your code base up uh, because of limitations of the tooling. And so uh, think about a large code base where you, from which you are able to build many deliverables. So you know, think of dozens of cloud functions or dozens of uh, microservices uh, deployed as Docker images, whatever it is you're doing, you should be able to handle that in a single repo uh, with appropriate tooling. And Pants, while not exclusively for monorepos at all, is, does tend to shine uh, in that, like its, its advantages tend to shine in that architecture. So Pants, you know, it doesn't reinvent the wheel. It uses all the underlying tools that you're uh, used to, so uh, it supports at last I checked, 12 different linters, so black and rough and uh, flake eight and you know doc formatter and like a ton of these. Um, you can configure it to run those on your code uh, in an efficient way. It supports all three of the 
type checkers that I know about anyway, so MyPy and PyWrite and PyType. Um, it supports things like generating code using uh, Thrift and the protocol buffer compiler. Uh, it supports PyTest, it supports measuring coverage, it supports, uh, obviously, it uses pip under the covers. So it kind of really brings that whole tool ecosystem uh, together and sort of orchestrates it for you. So I thought it'd be good to look at some examples that mirror the cargo examples we looked at earlier. So, uh, back to, for the last time, I hope, to uh, mirroring. How's that look? Yep, okay, so I'm gonna switch over to the Python tab. Did that work? Yep, cool. So we've got our Python hello world here. Um, there's a pass.toml, um, which is just a config file that we can ignore. Um, there's the python default.lock, which, uh, you know, spoiler alert, Python lock files are about to happen. Uh, but I did just want to show you uh, that this is basically empty. Right? It just, hold on, let me. Uh, right, it, it is this generated lock file that just has a bunch of kind of default empty metadata in it. Um, and then uh, inside the source directory, we've got our hello world, obviously, and we've got this file called build, all uppercase, which is a convention um, across several of these tools. Uh, Bazel uses this convention, Buck does, a bunch of other tools do, where this is where metadata goes uh, that describes your code to the tool. And we will talk about the difference between pants build files and some of those other tools build files a bit later. So there's no, no compilation, right? It's Python. but it would be nice to be able to run this uh, in the same way that we did um, with Cargo. So uh, pants uh, run source hello world.py. So it's doing a bunch of preliminary work, which includes, you know, to run a Python binary, you have to find a Python interpreter that is compatible. And really, that should only take like two seconds. So I'm not exactly sure what's going on here. Oh, OK, it did eventually finish. Um, so obviously there's a bunch of weird preliminary work that you would you know, not normally want to incur when you run a Python uh, uh, binary, but naturally when you run it the second time, you don't incur that. So uh, we can run the binary same as we did before. Uh, and while there is no compilation, there is type checking, right? So we can run MyPy, we can do pants check, um, colon colon, which is just shorthand for like check everything underneath this. Um, and you can see that it's saying, oh, that means I need to install uh, MyPy, so I'm going to do that, um, right? Because it's the first time I've, I've cleaned all my state, and so there is no MyPy on my system, and now there is. Uh, and now it's uh, running MyPy on our one file. Unfortunately, MyPy has, is slow and has this slow startup, so it's going to take a while. Um, but um, it should type check. Uh, that's literally 12 seconds spent inside MyPy. Uh, which is unfortunate. But again, run it a second time, everything's very fast. So, uh, and if I make changes, as you can imagine, only the work that needs to be done a second time will be done a second time. Uh, we, in our previous example, we looked at running tests, so let's do that. So the diff now um, adds a unit test and also adds to that build file a little stanza that says, hey, pants, there are some tests in here, please pay attention. So, pants test, colon, colon, and now the same thing. It's saying, well, I need to install PyTest in order to run um, tests, so I'm going to do that, and then I'm going to run the tests, and obviously, second time, it actually did no work at all because the test results were um, stored in memory. Uh, similarly, with um, linting and uh, fixing, so basically the exact same lint errors from before, an import we're not using, and a bunch of unnecessary white space. And so now we do uh, pants fix. And now it's, I've configured it to use um, rough and I think black. Yep. And so it installed, it had to download and install rough and then ran it and then it downloaded and installed black and is now running it. Uh, and it made some changes. <laughs> and so now if we look at the changes, it got rid of that superfluous import and it fixed the <coughs> white space issues. So, hold on, going back to our deck. So you've seen that these are basically pretty much one-for-one -one equivalents, 
So what features does Pants have that lets you build at scale? So the key observation here is that almost all the work done by a build system of any kind involves running other tools in processes. So there's a bunch of setting stuff up and you know creating workflow graphs and whatever, and sometimes that can be laborious, and th that is, of course, all cache. But really, almost all the work is, in the Python case, running MyPy, running PyTest, running you know whatever the dozens of tools you're using are. Now, Pants runs each process in a sandbox, i.e., it creates a temporary directory, uh, links all the input files in there, uh, output files can only go in there. And that means that the output of a process is fully defined by its inputs. And the inputs are obviously the files, the binary itself, its command line arguments, uh, the environment, but that's it. And that means that if you can um, fingerprint all those inputs, you can cache those outputs. Um, against uh, the, those fingerprints of those inputs. And so caching just kind of falls out of the design of the uh, Pants API here. You, if you're writing some custom build step, you don't need to think about it. But what happens is every time Pants wants to run a process, it first consults a cache. And if that process has ever been run uh, in the lifetime of the cache uh, with those inputs, it skips running it entirely and you um, get the result out of cache. Um, caching can be local. So as you're iterating on your MacBook, you um, you know, a huge amount of time is saved from like not running the same tests over and over again because their results are cached. Uh, it can also be uh, remote, and that's really important in CI because CI containers traditionally, typically come up clean, right? They have no state, so there is no local cache. But uh, if you have a remote cache, then your CI containers can connect to it and fetch results from that cache. And so we've very frequently seen CI go from like, uh, our own project CI go from like 60 minutes to like five minutes because almost all the work, if you make it a relatively small change, not a lot of tests needed to be rerun. Maybe none of them did. So um, Pants can figure that out for you with the help of caching. Um, concurrency. So again, because processes are fully defined by their inputs and outputs and they don't rely on side effects and they don't produce side effects, uh, Pants knows exactly when the input of one process depends on the output of another, which means that it can reason about concurrency, and it knows um, when um, you can run, uh, use multiple cores on the same machine to run, for example, many tests uh, concurrently, uh, or even maybe dozens of concurrent processes on a remote execution cluster if you have one uh, set up. And Pants computes um, the work it needs to do in a fine-grained way. So the, uh, it uses dependencies at the file level to figure out um, you know, what, what needs to be uh, considered in a cache key. And so um, it does this because it has a, a, this feature called dependency inference where, uh, where other tools like Bazel and Buck and tools that I've mentioned require you to provide dependency metadata externally to the tool, which is laborious and error-prone and hard to do. Uh, Pants will actually use static analysis on your code, look at your imports, and figure out your dependencies from that. So your build files can be very, very succinct. Uh, in fact, we're working on mostly eliminating them altogether because if all they have is a bunch of boilerplate, then that's just silly, and we should get rid of them. So um, when it comes to performance, uh, dependency inference is the kind of the secret source here um, that lets you um, get this uh, faster performance without this huge uh, metadata setup burden. And so finally, um, as we talked about in Cargo, Pants deals with, and as promised, Pants uh, deals with lock files. So Pants uses um, PEX, which is a tool that's part of the Pants project, uh, which in turn uses pip under the covers to generate these fully pinned uh, Python lock files, so very similar to the Cargo ones uh, we showed. And so we can very quickly look at an example. Um, for the last time, I will go back to the terminal. See that? Great. So if we look at uh, what I've added here, um, there's a new build file that just says to uh, Pants, hey, there are some requirements here. Uh, then the lock file that I showed you earlier was empty is now not so empty. Right? There's all this stuff going on in it, all these uh, pinned uh, dependencies. Uh, the actual requirement uh, that we added is here in requirements.txt, and it's on ANSI colors, which is much like the cargo one. It, uh, uh, does terminal coloring, and then here's how we're using it. And so now, if I uh, pants run, you can see that it's actually now resolving ANSI colors, downloading it, uh, installing it into a, like a hidden virtual environment, and then we get the uh, 
the effect. Um, and all we had to do was change some config. Um, so, some very quick notes in the couple of minutes remaining about the architecture of pants in case uh, you are curious and I'm greatly simplifying. Basically, there are two layers to pants. There's the Rust execution engine. It's written in Rust and it's uh, so that it can be very, very fast. And that's the thing that actually runs all your processes and does all the caching and the concurrency. Um, and then there's this large set of plugins. And plugins consist of rules that are relevant to a specific domain. So the Python plugin deals with uh, building and testing Python. And the um, Java plugin does Java. And the Scala plugin does Scala. And it's exactly what you think. Um, and these rules are written in Python, and in fact, they are just type annotated async uh, Python coroutines. Uh, and so they're very easy to write. The API is not small, but um, you don't have to know any Rust uh, to deal with it. So currently, there are plugins for Python, and in fact, the Python support is split into several plugins because you, you, know, you have to pick one of the, or a few of the 12 linters and the three type checkers and so on. And so you do that by opting in and out of the various uh, sub plugins. So there's plugins for Python, obviously, for Java, for Scala, for Kotlin, Go, Shell. Um, for JavaScript, still a work in progress. Um, not quite prime time ready yet. Uh, Docker, Terraform, Helm, uh, and a bunch of other things. And so that's the kind of very basic architecture, core Rust engine, bunch of Python code that it uh, executes. Um, Pants runs in a daemon so that when you run the pants command line, it's actually uh, connecting to this. Sorry, did my screen die? Okay, well, it was the last slide. Um, so pants runs in a daemon because a huge amount of its state uh, lives in memory, and so that speeds things up quite dramatically. And that daemon also does file watching. So um, if you uh, make edits to your file, it can pick them up before you actually try and do anything with those files, so the state is already updated in memory. And finally, Pants has a feature called environments that lets you cross-build. So it can run those processes that we talked about in Docker containers instead of natively on the platform. So uh, with some setup, you could use this, for example, to build uh, Linux wheels on Mac OS and stuff like that. Um, so that's kind of it. Um, Pants is a very uh, friendly open source uh, community at pantsbuild.org, which I wish was on the screen, but I guess isn't. Uh, anyway, pretty easy to find online. And if you go there and click on the community link, then there's a link to our Slack uh, channel, uh, our Slack workspace, and there's a lot of friendly people there who would be very happy to answer questions. If you have some challenges scaling a growing Python code base and you envy uh, what Rust has with Cargo, then uh, probably worth taking a look at Pants. Thank you very much.